It is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Paul, uh, Paul Houston that uh, will speak about uh, efficient implementation of uh, high-order HP uh, discontinuous galerkin uh, methods. So please, uh, Paul. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to obviously thank the organisers. I was going to say it's very nice to be here. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm actually sitting in my bedroom at home doing this. <laughs> so it would be much nicer to have uh, been in Rome, but uh, it's really nice to see everybody. And, uh, you know, it's been a really, really nice workshop. So, uh, so thanks very much. Um, so uh, this is uh, joint work uh, with uh, Paola. Um, and then uh, it was one of Paola's um, PhD student, Giorgio Penasi, who spent um, uh, quite a bit of time with me in Nottingham, which was very nice, and also some joint work with Andre Suli. Um, so as I, you know, um, uh, so as the title suggests, uh, we're really looking at kind of fast implementation techniques, and, and multi, uh, which includes uh, quadrature and, and multi-level solvers. So um, just to give you a plan of the talk, so I'll, I'll give a very brief background that I, I, I kind of feel I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a good audience. I don't need to justify why we want to use crazy shaped elements. Um, so um, I'll keep that quite brief. And I'll say a little bit about actually how we use DG on polytopic grids. And then, as I said, the, the two main areas are thinking about how we do fast assembly techniques and then um, domain decomposition uh, preconditioners or indeed general multi-level solvers you, you, you can use as well. So um, the, I suppose the reason we originally got interested in looking at um, general polytopic grids, and actually this original work was also done with power as well, was um, thinking about how do we discretize PDEs when you have very complex geometries. And so, um, so we found these uh, early papers by Hackbush and Sauter, which we're looking at this class of methods called uh, composite finite element methods, or I suppose what we refer to nowadays as agglomerated finite element methods. Um, and, and really the key observation was that if we have a very complex geometry, and so I've, you know, I've, I've picked a couple of uh, examples that we're interested in looking at. So one's ice secretion and uh, another project we have is looking at flows through placenta. And I'll show a few other examples in just a moment is that if we if we if we're bound to use um, standard element shapes, then then we have this issue that kind of the the minimum dimension of our finite element space is proportional to how complex our geometry is. And so the idea of Hackbush and Salter was was I suppose relatively simple that you you imagine that you you do have a fine grid uh, which does exactly represent the geometry, uh, perhaps up to some approximation, but but keeps um, a good representation of the complexity. And then the idea is really what we would now term to agglomerate the elements, so to, so to glue elements together. And so they referred to this as a composite finite element method. And then the difficulty there was that they're interested in using um, conforming methods. And, and it's really how, do you, how can you glue these elements together to create a composite finite element space in a conforming way? Um, so motivated by that work, we, we got interested in how could we expend, uh, so extend DG methods in this case. And so we were interested in how could we extend this idea to incorporate high order accuracy while retaining the geometric flexibility. And of course, I don't need to tell anyone in this conference, there's a whole zoo of methods now, which are very well developed, which, um, which are uh, suited to polytopic grids and you know, I, I feel like, I feel I should almost apologise that um, I, I'm not going to talk about virtual elements today. So f forgive me for that. Um, I, I'm really just going to focus on DG methods, although some of the techniques I'll, I'll talk about are, are applicable more generally as well. So when you think about wanting to use polytopic grids, there's a lot of issues that um, you, know, you start to face. So both from mathematical challenges as well as actually how you implement these things efficiently. So um, the early work that we did um, with a variety of people, and I'll, I'll reference them uh, later on, is, you know, first of all, how do you deal with a general element of arbitrary shape? We no longer have element mappings, so everything has to be done on the fly. Um, 
But then there are issues around actually what's the geometry look like of these elements. So you, you can easily have uh, degenerating lower dimensional facets. So, you know, very small edges, very small faces. And, and indeed, under mesh refinement, you can potentially have an unbounded number of edges and faces. And so while this might be OK in some settings, particularly in the DG framework, where we have some form of stabilization, then dealing with these small faces or small edges can be really problematic in the scheme. And so you have to be quite careful in the analysis uh, of how you deal with that. But what I, as I said before, what I want to focus on is actually more now how we actually implement these methods. So uh, how do we do quadrature and how can we use these techniques to develop efficient linear solvers? So um, I'm really just want to focus on the DG framework. Um, and I, I've always quite liked DG methods because it allows us to do a lot of different types of multi-physics problems. So we've worked on a whole variety of different applications. Um, there's lots of applications that arise in obviously mathematical biology. So we've done some work on uh, tumor modeling, um, looking at stress in trabecular bone, um, flows relevant to tissue engineering. So here the geometries are incredibly complicated that, that you have to deal with. A really nice project that we've been working on for a number of years is looking at um, flows and the corresponding chemistry in uh, chemical vapor deposition reactors, which are relevant for growing synthetic diamonds. Uh, we've got um, a recent project on looking at heart modeling applications. And we've also done work on neutron transport. And more recently, we're looking at radiation transport applications as well. And of course, within the framework, uh, I'm not really going to talk about this today, but we saw this um, in uh, Enrique's talk yesterday and also Manolis. You know, it's very easy to incorporate uh, H adaptivity. Um, as, and, and also, in the, particularly in the DG framework, we can easily do HP adaptivity on these types of grids. So, so it's, a, it's a very nice, flexible framework. OK, so let me just very briefly talk about DG methods. And I'm, I'm going to keep it really simple. So we're going to consider our very nice, simple problem, a Poisson problem. But here we've got a diffusion um, parameter rho. So we will have to pay attention to this when we look at the multi-level solvers. And I'll say more about that later on. But essentially, the setup's quite standard. So um, you know, we, we have some form of mesh, and there's a uh, a number of different tools available. So polymesh is very nice in 2D, but a lot of the grids we work on are typically based on using some form of agglomeration. And then our DG finite element space is standard. The, the only real difference is that now there is no uh, element mapping. So there's, um, there's good aspects about not having element mappings and defining polynomials in physical space in, in terms of approximation properties. But the downside of this is that um, you can't cache elements. So um, everything has to be done on the fly. So, so dealing with these types of elements is more expensive, unfortunately. Um, so for the DG method, um, I'm just going to use a symmetric interior penalty scheme. So this is completely standard. Um, to be honest, any flavor of uh, DG is, is, in, is entirely fine. This just tends to be our method of choice. The only slight difference here is that we've got um, material weighted averages um, in the interface terms. This just makes sure that you have better treatment when you have um, highly heterogeneous uh, diffusion data. And so always the, always the issue with DG methods is how you stabilize. So this, this magic sigma, and I'm, I'm not, I don't want to talk about this today. <laughs> That's another couple of talks in its own right. But essentially, we all know it has to scale at p squared over h. It's just a question of what's the definition of h when you're on a polytopic grid. And so, as I said, a lot of our early work, so work with Paola and then um, you know, work with Andrea Kanjani, Peter Dong and Manolis Gorgoulis. Um, we, we looked at this, you know, and, and it really boils down to you know, uh, proving robust uh, inverse estimates. And then a more recent generalization, I think uh, Manolis, Manolis likes to call this the DGEs method, where they've uh, generalized the analysis to even more general elements, including elements with curvature. Um, 
So that's our scheme. Um, so let's think about actually how do we assemble the grid. So going back again to the original work by Hackbush and Salter, the, the idea was that, um, so they had, so their core space or the space you want to work on, they called their CFE or composite finite element space. So the idea was very much kind of using ideas from multi-level solvers is that the core spaces functions are derived essentially from some form of prolongation of basis functions that come from the fine space. And indeed, in our original work, we, we, we also um, use this technique. Um, and and this, is, this is very nice, because if you have a fine space solver, then it's very easy uh, to actually create your, your composite solver from that. Um, but if you don't have uh, a composite mesh, then instead, um, what, what we now do is that we create essentially, the idea is to put a bounding box around each polygonal element. And on this bounding box, we simply define um, a, a polynomial space. Um, so we use tensor product Legendre polynomials, which are mapped from a reference element uh, or reference bounding box. Alternatively, you can use some form of Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization on, on the element itself and actually just use an orthogonal basis. Um, so that's our basis. So what's nice about using um, unmapped approximations is that the order of approximation is independent of the element shape. Um, and also uh, calculating derivatives becomes almost trivial. So if you've ever tried to work out um, so second derivatives, for example, when you have mapped elements, when you have curvature, is is actually really difficult to compute. Whereas when you when you're in this framework, it's really really simple. But as I said before, the, the downside of this is the computational overhead. So everything has to be done on the fly because no, nothing can be cached. So, um, so one of the key bottlenecks in the assembly is obviously numerical integration. So. I suppose that the most common approach is to use some form of element tessellation. Um, so this you can compute um, for each element, or if you've or if you've done agglomeration, you've essentially got it for free. The problem with this is it tends to be quite expensive. Obviously, it depends on how many elements you have in the sub tessellation. So there is some recent work by uh, Peter Dong, Manolis, and um, I think it was one of Manolis' students, Capas. Well, they've used GPU acceleration techniques to actually improve the performance when you use sub tessellation. Alternatively, you can try to think about um, coming up with optimal quadratures in the sense of minimizing the number of points you need on a polygon uh, in order to integrate the space of uh, functions you need to integrate. So this is uh, an idea that comes from moment quadratures. But the idea I'd like to talk about is this idea which um, Sukumar talked about on Monday, is this idea about um, exploiting uh, integration of homogeneous functions. So as I said, Sukumar's already spoken about it, so I, I won't go into this in great detail, but I have to say this is really, really simple, but, but um, really powerful. Uh, and it's really, really nice, actually. So I, 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 I would like to spend a little bit of time talking about this, and then I'll say actually how we implement this with, with our DG method and the kind of performance gains you can get. So if we forget about finite elements for a moment, we just think about we have a polytopic domain P and we want to integrate a, um, uh, an arbitrary function F over my polytopic domain. And then we're going to assume that F is a homogeneous function of degree Q. Then it's very easy to prove all this homogeneous function theorem that you have a direct relationship between f and its derivative. And this is, this is the key, of course. Um, so the idea then is that if you apply Stokes' theorem, so I've stated it here for an arbitrary vector valued function g, if I replace g by x and employ Euler's homogeneous function theorem, then suddenly my integral of my function f over my polytope is the same as some weighted integral of f over the boundary of my polytope. So here I'm going to assume the polytope's got is you know it's 
polygonal polyhedral, so it's got straight edges. And so this is a huge saving. And, and so you, you kind of see with homogeneous functions, they're well behaved in some sense that, that I don't need information regarding f on the interior of the domain in order to actually compute its integral. So the idea is if we break this term, the integral term into some of the faces or you know, d minus one dimensional facets more generally, then x dot n is a constant. I can pull this outside the integral and then I repeat the process again. Okay, so, uh, so if we do that, so I, I, I denote uh, fi to be, uh, let, let's think about 3D for the time being, so I'll, I'll, I'll call this a face. So I, I break up my integral to be integral over some of the faces. As I said, this term is now a constant. And so now the idea is to now repeat the process again where we apply Stokes theorem, but now we have to apply Stokes theorem in the plane in which this face lives. So when you do this, it's not as clean in the sense that, uh, so it's just some notation in the sense that, let, let me get to the final formula that, that now the integral over one of my faces, so I get, I get the integral. So these are the edges, which are appropriately scaled. So I get the integral of F around the edges, but because I'm in an arbitrary orientated plane, I still get an integral over the face uh, of the derivative of F itself, okay? But if I'm in 2D, these Fij's, so this is the boundary of my face, are actually just points. So this is in fact just point evaluation. And the Xi's that come into these um, terms, they're essentially just a reference point or, or an origin for whatever facet you're living on. So Xi is, a, is an origin for the face and Xj is an origin for this uh, D minus one dimensional, sorry, D minus two dimensional facet Fij. Okay. So if we plug all this together, then we now have the integral of f over my polytope in terms of an integral of f of the gradient of f around uh, the boundary. Um, but then I've got an integral of just f around um, the d minus two dimensional facets. So in, in 2D, these are point evaluations, okay? So, so in 2D, I've got point evaluations of f and an integral around the boundary of the gradient of f. And if you're in 3D, you again, you repeat the same process again and you get a very similar formula. So apologies, I've, I've done that slightly quickly, but I, I'm, I hope you can see it's um, a relatively straightforward thing to do. So that's, that's um, a very simple result that holds for arbitrary polytopes. So the question is, how, how do we implement that in an efficient way? And I really just want to focus on a monomial um, because I'm thinking about how do I use this in the DG context, or actually a general finite element method for that matter. So obviously a monomial is, is a homogeneous function, but equally so are all of its derivatives. And so the idea, if we go back to the formula, is if I start, let's just think about 2D for the time being. So this, this is a point evaluation. This is an integral around the boundary. If I start from the lowest order monomials, so I start with constants, this term vanishes and I get, and I work, I can work out what, what the volume of the element is. So I've got the integral of one. When I then go to the next monomial up, so I go to X, well then this term, this will be just the integral of one around the boundary. This I've already computed. Um, and this again will be a, a point evaluation. So if you, if you uh, go through recursively and, and store the integrals of the previous monomials that you've already seen, then actually in this context, all you ever need is to compute point evaluations of either, either the function or its derivatives at, at the vertex points, which makes this really, really efficient. And so just to give you an, an idea of the kind of efficiency gains uh, you can get with this. So we've looked, we, we looked at three very simple shapes. So a, a, a triangle, a, a is a pentagon and then just an arbitrary shape, P3. Um, we looked at various different monomials. So algorithm A1 is our quadrature free, and these are the timings for each of uh, these elements to compute the corresponding integral. 
And then um, A th the algorithm A3 is when you use subdivision. So on a triangle, there is no subdivision because I have a quadrature. Um, and then A2 is where we simply apply the first step of using homogeneous uh, function theorem. And then we use a quadrature on the edges. And so you see that actually, even just on a single element, the performance gain you know, is, is, well, actually several orders of magnitude difference de depending on you know, the, the, uh, uh, the order of your monomial. But that's just a single integral. Um, but what you, what you can show in general is that if I, if I want to integrate, say, x to the k, y to the k, then using quadrature free, um, you can prove that um, the quadrature th free algorithm should scale like order k. Whereas if you use any type of quadrature or you know, subtestillation of quadrature, then you get a scaling of order k to the three. Um, and in particular, what's of interest to find element methods is, let's consider the whole set of monomials up to a given order p. Then uh, to compute all of the integrals of all of these monomials, I can do this in order p to the d operations. So it's very, very cheap. So when applying this to any kind of finite element method or in particular DG method, obviously we, we don't want to use the monomial basis. So just as a recap, we're going to have a bounding box. On the bounding box, we're going to use tensor product Legendre polynomials, um, which have been scaled from a reference bounding box. So then the simple approach then is just for each of these um, Legendre polynomials, I write them as an expansion of monomials. So these C coefficients give me the monomial coefficient. Then I can think about either computing the mass matrix, the element mass matrix, or the element stiffness matrix. So if we just think about the element mass matrix, then it's a very simple formula. The element mass matrix is given by the product of these Cs times the uh, Jacobian. And then I just need all the integrals of all my monomials up to degree uh, uh, 2p. Okay. But the key point is that these products are entirely independent of the elements. So you can actually just compute them once and for all at the beginning of the calculation. Um, so volume integration becomes super efficient in this setting. Faces is a different matter. So uh, when you when you want to integrate over faces, you, you've got two different types of contributions. The first type is where you're always on the same element. So if I think of an arbitrary face, I've got my kappa plus on one side and kappa minus on the other, then you can use exactly the same techniques to compute the face matrices involving the plus plus terms or the minus minus in exactly the same way. The difficult or the most expensive term to compute is when you have an interaction between the two elements. So this corresponds to the off, the, the off diagonal entries um, where, and, and the idea here, so you have like a plus minus or a minus plus term, you have to rewrite the monomial basis from one element in terms of, of the expansion from the other element. And this you have to do on the fly. So this is more expensive. Um, but we've tested this in uh, 2D and 3D. So let me very briefly show you the results. So in, in assembly in, in 2D, um, so I should say, actually, once, once you do this technique, there's no longer a concept of elements or faces because everything becomes face-based. But just to show comparisons, um, I, I will actually uh, compute the element stiffness matrices separately from, from the element face matrices. Um, so in red, we've got um, uh, standard subtessellation on polytopic grids, and then in blue, is the quadrature three. So this is for P1 to three and then four, five and six. So these are the element mass and stiffness matrices and these are the face matrices. So, so you see that the, um, the element matrices are really cheap to compute now. The face matrices, be, because of this re-expansion that you have to do online calculations, while you still see a saving, the saving is, is only, well in 2D it's about a factor two. Um, but if you switch to 3D, the saving gets a little substantially larger. So it's about a factor five for the face matrices. But these now become the more expensive part of the calculation as opposed to even in 3D, the volume uh, integrals are, are incredibly cheap. 
Um, and of course, in, in 3D, the face matrices, you may, to compute those, the faces may not be um, standard elements, which is what we're assuming here. They could be general polyhedral, in which case you'd need to do uh, sub-tessellation further. So the speed up in 3D is potentially even more. Okay, so that's quadrature free. Um, so that's how we assemble the matrices. So now let me briefly go into domain decomposition. So, um, so even if you're not interested in polytopic grids, um, you may still want to run your solver with standard element shapes. By having the ability to use polytopic grids means that implementing multi-level solvers um, is really, really simple. And so uh, there's a vast amount of literature that's been done on uh, DG methods in both H version, HP version for domain decomposition and multi-level multi-grid solvers. Indeed, Powell has done an awful, an awful lot of work in this area. Um, so here are some references, and I apologize, this is probably not complete. Um, so just to recall our original problem, um, we can show that if you, um, um, if you have an orthogonal basis, then, then um, the condition number of our underlying matrix scales like P to the 4 over H squared. So in the following slides on the right hand side in red, I'm going to write the algebraic rep representation of the operators, which personally I always find much easier. So, so I'm just going to look at domain decomposition for this. And what we want to do is we, we want to um, develop a solver which is scalable both with respect to the fine mesh size H, the fine polynomial degree P, and I'd like to also be robust with respect to the diffusion coefficient if, if possible. So, so the setup is slightly non-standard, but um, should be um, fairly recognizable. So the idea of domain decomposition, so we have our fine grid TH, which are the black uh, polygons here, and then we've got two other partitions. So the blue uh, mesh, um, this is bold face H, sorry, blackboard uh, uh, H is, um, uh, is our subdomain partition, which is where we're going to apply local solvers. So these are generally constructed based on agglomerating elements from your fine grid. And then you have a coarse grid, um, which you, you can construct in many different ways. You can first of all construct uh, based on agglomeration of your existing elements, say from the um, subdomain partition. So this would be the nested approach, which is what we've got on the left. Or you could think about agglomerating elements as well as doing agglomeration of edges or edge coarsening which gives you a non-nested coarse grid. Um, so what's slightly different here is that we are, as you can see from the pictures, we're going to allow the subdomain partition to be um, a lot uh, finer than the coarse, the coarse grid. So we need to keep track of the mesh size of these subdomains. And in fact, what we're particularly interested in is this massively parallel setting where actually the subdomain partition you just set equal to the um, the fine grid. Um, now, the reason for wanting to do that is these local solvers you have to apply on these blue elements become really trivial, and in fact, um, you can simply compute the inverse of the matrix and store it. So, so the application is is very, is very very cheap. Um, so now. Um, for the domain decomposition, this is completely standard. So um, we first of all, for the local solvers, we define our local finite element spaces on each of these subdomains, um, which is just the restriction of our fine finite element space onto these uh, subdomains. Um, and then the local solver or local matrix problem is solved, so it is constructed simply by applying um, the standard prolongation operator, which is just for DG, just a straightforward injection operator, which takes you from the local space to the fine space. So here, you're essentially applying um, a restriction operator to your large matrix, and then you have a prolongation operator. Okay, so this is very simple uh, to implement. So this is an exact solver. And then the core solver is constructed similarly. So we have our, our core space. Um, and again, the coarse matrix is constructed based on restriction of the fine matrix onto the coarse space. 
in the, in the same way. So again, this is the algebraic representation. So the key thing here is our prolongation operator now in order to account for uh, both nested and non-nested coarse grids, we use an L2 projection operator to go from coarse space to fine space. Okay. And then, it's, and then we simply define the Schwartz operators in the usual way. So we have these uh, operators, these PIs, which, which you can prove are projection operators. And then you can either construct an additive Schwartz precondition, which is all we're going to look at, or you can think about some multiplicative or hybrid type Schwartz operator. And so the algebraic representation of this is quite straightforward. So we have essentially you have our matrix applied, uh, which is being pre-multiplied by a preconditioner. And the preconditioner is simply restrict, solve, prolongate. And you do this on the coarse grid as well as all of these local subspaces. So this is completely standard. So I suppose th this is, I think, the most general result we now have, which combines or generalizes uh, results we proved in the past under various different assumptions. So um, here, one, one thing to know is we, we're not assuming now um, that the domain is convex, which is a standard assumption. So instead, we've moved the convexity condition to the coarse elements. So we're going to assume the coarse elements are convex. This turns out to not be necessary in practice. But then you can show the condition number in the nested case of your additive Schwartz preconditioner scales in this form. So you have uh, the ratio of the maximum of your diffusion parameter divided by the minimum on each of these coarse elements. So in particular, if, 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 your, uh, if your row is piecewise constant on the grid and is um, exactly represented, so if it's constant on each coarse element, then in fact, the preconditioner, irrespective of whether you have high contrast, is completely independent of, of the diffusion. Um, and then you have kind of a spaghetti mess of uh, fine polynomial degrees, coarse polynomial degrees, uh, fine mesh size, coarse mesh size, and then the mesh size of the um, uh, of, of your sub uh, of your local subdivision. Okay. So in the massively parallel case, um, when when you have non-nested grids, um, you actually see a degeneration in the polynomial order. So in fact. Um, so we've only studied this for the uniform diffusion case. This, 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 this is quite technical when you, when you have to transfer information between these two non-nested spaces. Um, but you see actually now you get like a P to the four over Q squared. Um, this, as we'll see in numerics in just a moment, is, we're unclear whether this is actually optimal or suboptimal. Um, now, the, the proof I won't go through this in any great detail. It, it's completely standard. It, if you can prove these three properties, so local stability, strength and Cauchy Schwartz inequality, and stable decomposition, then the parameters in these bounds, you can then, uh, from the result in Toselli and Vidland, show how the condition number is bounded. So the question is how, you know, is simply to go, go, go back and verify these properties hold. So property one is simple. Um, because we've used exact solvers. So in fact, we have equality with alpha is one. The strength in cauchy schwarz inequality is relatively straightforward and simply depends on how many neighbors each subpartition or the maximum number of neighbors any subpartition can have in the grid. So this is the spectral radius of this matrix here. But always the tricky part uh, is, is trying to prove you have a stable decomposition. And so you need to be able to show that you have a decomposition of, of the fine solution in terms of uh, these uh, prolongation of the coarse and the um, coarse solution, as well as uh, prolongation of these solutions from your local space. And moreover, that you have this one-sided bound. And so this is essential to actually show that the, um, the Schwartz operator is invertible. So the trick to doing this is, um, or is that you need to prove that you have an approximation property. So of this type, where if I take any function from my find space, I need to be able to show that I can find 
a corresponding function from my core space such that I have an optimal approximation result of this form. So this is relatively straightforward to prove. And, and, and in fact, there's some, a really nice paper by Ian Smears. He was looking at this in the H2 setting where you essentially prove a course, the key result you need is based on a duality argument. So what you need to be able to show in order to prove the approximation property is that if I take any function from my DG fine finite element space, I can find a conforming approximate. So this is very reminiscent of the types of result you need for our posteriori error estimation. Indeed, Manolis uh, presented precisely results of this form on Monday. So, so these are relatively standard to prove. And this is, this is why we need a convexity because it's based on the duality argument. So in the uniform diffusion case, you do this on the whole of the domain. When you have non-uniform uh, diffusion, we, we, we have to derive local results. So that's why we need these coarse group elements uh, to be convex. So this is in the um, nested setting. So this is exactly what goes wrong when you go non-nested. In the non-nested case, you see a degeneration in the polynomial order. And the reason for this, unfortunately, is because you have to use an inverse estimate. And unfortunately, when it comes to P methods, the inverse estimate is, is always the evil guy that makes everything go wrong and makes you sub suboptimal. And so, so this is where this additional P comes from uh, in the condition number estimate. OK, so let's just do uh, a, a few numerics to, to look at this. So. As I said, the result very much generalizes what we already had, but in a more general setting. So if we just think of uh, just a 3D problem, um, we, we fix the polynomial degrees, and then we look at um, uh, the condition number, um, which is the first number, and the number of iterations it takes for a CG to converge. Then as we, so this is the number of elements in the fine grid, number of elements in the coarse grid, um, then if you go down any of the diagonals or the super diagonals, you expect these numbers to remain roughly constant, uh, which is precisely what you see. And then on the bottom line, we've got the condition number of the actual full matrix itself uh, and the number of iterations it takes for uh, CG to converge. Um, so that's pretty standard and straightforward, which is what we expect. So. So let's think about non-uniform diffusion. So as we said, if, if uh, we've got a piecewise constant uh, diffusion parameter, if it's, if, we can, if it's constant on a coarse grid element, um, then we expect that the condition number will be completely insensitive to any heterogeneity in, in rho. So if we do the mesh aligned approach, so the idea here is we've taken rho to be one on the odd elements, odd coarse elements, and we've taken it to be equal to some other value rho e, which we vary from 10 to 10 to the six on the uh, even elements. Then using both convex and non-convex coarse elements, you see that the condition numbers are completely insensitive to the jumps in the diffusion, which is what we expect. Of course, if you violate this condition, so if, if the coarse grid can't represent these jumps exactly, then unfortunately you do see the dependence, which is what we expect. And in this case, you have to do some form of um, multi-scale or you know, uh, sub substructuring uh, techniques to get around this. So the final thing is dependence in P. So if we, if we allow the coarse grid polynomial degree Q to be the same as the fine polynomial degree, then in the nested case, we expect the condition number to increase like order P in the non-nested order p squared. And sure enough, this is what we see. So these, are, these lines are for different grids uh, in the nested setting. And so you can see this is roughly of order p. In the non-nested, we see order p squared converges. So it looks like it's, it's, it's optimal with respect to p, but this isn't the case when p, when p and q are the same. Um, in the case, when we keep Q fixed, so Q being the polynomial degree for the coarse grid, then we, uh, we no longer see optimality in the non-nested setting. So in the nested case, we expect to see order P squared um, increase in the condition number, which is precisely what we do see. 
um, um, for two different values of Q. But in the non-nested, we expect to see order P to the four. And in fact, we well, it's roughly around about P to the three, it's somewhere between P squared and P to the three. So it's not entirely optimal with respect to Q, although it's not clear why. And then very finally, and I have no analysis for this, but this was just a computation I felt like doing one afternoon, was once you've built all these operators, doing multigrid is almost trivial in the, in the polygonal world. You just, you just have more agglomerates in, in your code and you have all the intergrid transfer operators already built. So it's very easy to actually just use um, this uh, additive Schwartz method as a smoother inside a multigrid. So here we just did three smoothing steps within a multigrid algorithm. So we did a W cycle uh, and we varied the number of fine elements and we varied the number of levels in our multigrid. And sure enough, uh, you know, we, I must confess, we have no analysis for this, but it's the behavior we expect that you see um, convergence independent of the number of iterations, which, which is really nice. And so let me finish there. Um, so, um, so I, I'm, you know, I've, I've been a big fan of DG methods for a while. So I apologize to my VEM colleagues. Um, it's got a, a lot of really nice features in terms of the kind of geometry um, that, it, that it can handle and the types of problems that we can solve. Um, and in particular in this talk, you know, uh, the efficient implementation, I think is quite a nice uh, way of implementing DG methods, but equally, these, method, these approaches can be used in, in other types of methods as well. Um, and also we've looked at Schwartz type preconditioners in both nested and non-nested case. And we see condition number independent of heterogeneity as long as we can resolve it by the coarse grid. Um, and so in other work, we have also looked at multigrid uh, solvers. Um, I think a really nice um, way of using polygonal methods, as I said, is very much in the black box framework. So either a black box from a solver point of view, but also there's um, work we've done with Scott Congreve and Thomas Vila on application two grid methods, where again, you need you always need a coarse grid solver, which are quite efficient for nonlinear PDEs. Uh, and there's a range of different applications, which I've listed here uh, that we're currently looking at. And um, here's some of the papers. So I'll finish there. So thank you very much.